When you place this teddy bear in front of these mirrors, you get a reflection. And that reflection could be upright, it could be inverted, it could be bigger, it could be smaller. The rays of light could actually be where you think they are, or the rays of light can only be virtually where you think they are. Those are some of the things we're going to talk about in this video. It's all based upon the law of reflection. And the law of reflection is pretty straightforward. It just says the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So if this is a surface and something is coming into that, the angle that it comes in will equal the angle that it goes out. We are going to measure that angle to the normal. Yes, it's true that this and this are also equal, but we need to do it to the normal when we have curved surfaces. It'll make our lives a lot easier. So if you've played billiard or pool and you're going to do a bank shot, the cue ball is going to bounce off of the bumper or reflect off the bumper. Just like if we treated this and be let it behave like a mirror. We're going to take that, we're going to reflect it over there, and I want to have the cue ball hit this one, so all I got to do is aim for the reflection of that ball. If I get the reflection of that ball into the reflection of the pocket, this real ball will go into the real pocket. But the angle that it is incident and the angle that it reflects is equal. In fact, if you had a pool table like this and a real mirror that you set over the edge there, you would be invincible. All you got to do is aim for what you see in the mirror and it will bounce and everything will work out perfectly. If you're going to do a double bank shot, let's say we're going to bounce off of this bumper and this bumper, well, you treat this like a mirror and reflect that over here. And if you're going to bounce off of this, you treat this as a mirror or the reflection as a mirror. So we're going to take a reflection of the reflection. So where do we hit along here? Well, we just aim for the image. The angle that it is incident will equal the angle that it reflects, and then it's going to come off toward this one. But the angle that it is incident will equal the angle that it reflects, and we could get that ball into that pocket if we just aim for getting this ball into that pocket. Neat little thing here is just with Darth Vader, and you rotate it around, and Darth Vader turns into Yoda. How do you do that? Is it magic? No, there's just a mirror, and half of Yoda's glued to that mirror on this side, half of Darth Vader's glued to the other side, and the mirror just makes up the other half. When you look into a mirror, you see an image of yourself. And strangely enough, the farther you step back away from that, you do not see more of yourself. So right now I'm standing pretty close to the mirror. I see from my feet to my head. And if I stand further back, I still see feet to head. And if I stand really far, I still see feet to head. So let's see if we can understand this. When I stand in front of a mirror, there is an image of myself. And I don't need a mirror that goes all the way top to the bottom because the light that comes from my feet catches the bottom edge. The light from the top of my hat catches the top edge. They reflect off of the mirror and come into my eye. You know, law of reflection. So this ray of light comes in and this ray of light comes in. Those look as if they came from here and there, but that's where I see from head to toe, from the bottom of the mirror to there, just like I have there. If I went further back, my image also goes further back and the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection are still equal. If I look at the bottom edge of the mirror, I still see my feet. If I look at the top edge, I still see my head. And just zooming on all that, you see that your image does not change size when you stand further back away from the mirror. Kind of surprising. We have two different kinds of reflection. We have diffuse reflection or specular. Specular reflection occurs when the surface is very smooth. And if the surface is rough, like the water here, it produces diffuse reflection. Notice that we had an image when it was smooth, but there's no image when it's rough. So if I threw all these golf balls at this driveway, all parallel rays here, they're all hitting at the same angle of incidence, and they're all going to go off parallel. That would be specular because the driveway was smooth. If I threw the golf balls at this surface, well, that's going to be diffuse reflection. The law of reflection still holds. 
this golf ball hits this and this is the normal at that point. Angle of incidence, angle of reflection. This golf ball hit the surface here and that was the normal. Angle of incidence, angle of reflection. It's here, this is the normal, so it comes at a small angle and goes off at a small angle. But diffuse reflection, all these parallel paths go off in all sorts of crazy directions. That's because the surface was rough. Now yeah, it seems obvious, but could I get specular reflection with this surface? Could this surface behave smoothly? And it can if I threw a much, much larger object at it. The irregularities in the surface here were very, very small in comparison to the size of the object I was throwing at it. And that big object there would smooth out all those irregularities and it would just angle of incidence, angle of reflection as the whole of the surface. Now this idea of the surface being smooth or rough, that surface was rough, the, the rocks were rough for golf balls, but they were smooth for big old beach balls, is the same idea as what light does. There's different sizes of light. Radio waves are very big on the order of kilometers. Microwaves between meters and millimeters, infrared light somewhere between micrometers and millimeters, and then you have visible light, ultraviolet light, x-rays and gamma rays. Gamma rays are really, really tiny, and x-rays are pretty tiny as well. So the surface is gonna behave different depending on which kind of light you're throwing at it. For example, this is a microwave oven, and I have a mug in there, and you can see that mug because there's these little holes in this metal grid. Visible light is pretty small, and visible light can make it through those holes. Microwaves are a lot larger, and they're too big to make it through those holes. So this grid of holes here is going to behave like a very shiny mirror, smooth or specular reflection, for microwaves, but not for visible light. And then we have different kinds of telescopes. This is the James Webb Telescope polished incredibly smoothly, and it's gonna produce smooth reflections for probably infrared, visible, and ultraviolet, but it would probably produce diffuse reflections for X-rays and gamma rays. This is a radio or microwave telescope, and it's gonna be a very shiny polished mirror for those wavelengths depends on the size of the thing you're throwing at it. This piece of paper here looks very smooth. If I feel with my paper, it, with my finger, it feels smooth. But let's look at it on a microscopic level. We have a little E printed right on that paper, but if we really zoom in, we see that the surface is pretty rough. And the E printed there has pigments that if I shine all these rays of light onto the paper and the pigments, black pigments are going to absorb the light. So no light's gonna be reflecting off of that black. But because this paper is rough, in comparison to visible light, it's gonna reflect off in all crazy directions. So if I look from any direction here, I can see white light that came from there, I can see white light that came from there or there or there, when you look at the E on the paper, you're not seeing the E, you're seeing the paper all around the E, unless the E was red or something. When I shine all these rays of light here, now I'm showing white light, but white light is really the mixture of all sorts of colors, namely red, green, and blue. The red, the pigments here are going to absorb the greens and the blues and reflect the reds, and the white is gonna reflect all of the colors of light, but you're seeing all the reds here and here, you're seeing the reds everywhere there's red ink, and you're seeing the white everywhere there's the white paper. And that's because light is reflecting diffusely. All right, so let's say we had a bouquet of flowers here, and right here at the very top, we had red petals. Light is shining on those red petals, and light from those red petals is going to reflect diffusely, going out in all directions. 
And let me just state the obvious. Some of that light's gonna go into my eye, and where those rays of light really came together or originated from is where I'm gonna see that little spot of red. Okay, so you see the object where these rays of light originated from. Now let's talk about images. If I had a mirror and light was bouncing off of that mirror and spreading out after it reflected, if the reflected rays diverge, that's one thing that could happen on a mirror. Another thing that could happen on a mirror is the <clears throat> rays of light that reflect off of the mirror could actually come together and then spread out. So as they reflected off of the mirror, they would come together. So the reflected rays converge. These are two different kinds of images. So if I had my eye here and I looked at the rays coming off of those mirror, that mirror, those rays of light are gonna look as if they originated from there. So that's where I would see that little spot of red on the flower, and that's gonna be my image. We're gonna call that a virtual image because the rays of light are not really there. We have to imagine them extending backwards to see where they virtually come together. If I put my eye here and look at that, those rays of light that come into my eye are gonna look as if they originated from right there, just like we had up here. But the rays of light really came together there, so we're gonna call it a real image. And we have to be very careful to make the distinction between virtual and real images. Reflected rays diverge, so they only virtually come together. Reflected rays converged, so they really came together. Real and virtual images. So just like I have my real object here and we have light hitting that bouquet, red light is gonna reflect off diffusely, so is orange, so is white, so is green. But if I look at all those rays of light coming off of that object, where those rays of light actually come together is where I'm gonna see that spot of green or white or orange or red. If I had the bouquet of flowers over here and I had a mirror and I had red light spreading out like this, orange light, white light, green light, all hitting my mirror and they reflect off of that mirror and they continue spreading out here and I put my eye and I look at all those rays of light coming off that mirror, those rays of light, if we extend them backwards, all the red are gonna look like they came from there orange, white, and green, I would see an image of that object in the mirror. What kind of image is it, real or virtual? It's a virtual image. The reason being is the rays of light that reflected off that mirror spread out. They didn't really come together. Now I have a concave mirror here and I have a piece of paper there that I have light shining from behind and that piece of paper has this flower printed on it. When the light from behind hits that paper, the light spreads out. So like green light from there is gonna hit this mirror and reflect it and it came together there and put a little spot of green on the wall there. This pink light coming from right there spread out, hit my mirror and converged and concentrated that light onto the wall right there. The rays of light coming off the wall really came together. It really concentrated that light onto the wall and you got a real image. And that's one of the characteristics of real images is that they can be cast onto a screen. So let's say I have a concave mirror here and this is the center of its curvature and a ray of light comes in this line here, which goes right through the center of the mirror, is gonna be perpendicular to the mirror at that point. So this is the angle of incidence, and it's gonna reflect at an equal angle of reflection. If I had a ray of light coming down here, same thing. Where it hits, this is perpendicular or the normal. This is the angle of incidence. This is the angle of reflection. So the reflected ray comes here. And if I just do that all along the way, for hitting straight here in the middle, it's gonna come straight back there. And I'm gonna get the same thing on the lower half as I did the upper half. 
all these rays coming in, if they come in parallel, this is the angle of incidence, that's the angle of reflection, but all of those rays of light came together in a place called the focal point. All right. Now, if I had rays of light hitting further out here on the mirror, this is the angle of incidence, this is the angle of reflection, didn't quite go through the focal point. Angle of incidence, angle of reflection, didn't quite go through. Same thing for the bottom here, is that we got a focal point here for light that hit near the center, but not for the light that hit further out. This was a circular mirror, and a circle is a little bit different shape than a parabola. Although in through here, the circular shape and the parabolic shape have nearly the same shape. They start to get further apart the further out we go. So if my mirror was smaller here and these rays of light weren't even hitting the mirror, then I would get a nice focal point for a circular mirror. Let me just zoom in on that a little bit, but all these parallel rays of light are going to reflect through the focal point. This is the radius of the curvature and the distance from the mirror to the focal point we're going to call the focal length. And let's see if we can find a relationship between those two. The light came in at some angle and reflected off at an equal angle. Okay, And then we have this blue triangle here and we'll call if this is the angle here, if I have this ray parallel to this line and this is a transversal, these are alternate interior angles. We'll call the height of this triangle uh, A. The tangent of this angle is going to equal opposite over adjacent, A over R. If this is theta and this is theta, this is going to be 2 theta. So we have now this triangle. If that's 2 theta, this is going to be 2 theta because that's alternate interior angles as well. So the tangent of this angle is going to equal opposite over adjacent, A over the focal length. Well, I could solve this for A and solve that for A. They both equal A, so let me set them equal to each other. And here's an approximation that if I take an angle and multiply it by 2 and then take the tangent, or take the angle and then take the tangent, and then multiply by 2, for small angles up to maybe around 9 or 10 degrees, they're pretty close to one and the same. So this here is going to equal that there for small angles. So I'm going to substitute tangent of 2 theta in for 2 times the tangent of theta. Well, tangent of theta is on both sides, and if I divide both sides by 2, it looks like the focal length is going to equal half of the radius. All right, so let's say that I have my eye looking into this mirror and I place an object there. Red light is reflecting diffusely off that, spreading out. Some of that's going to hit my mirror and bounce off in this direction. Orange light reflects off and bounces off in this direction. White light and green light coming off like that. And we get this mess of all these rays of light. And if I look anywhere along here into the mirror, I'm going to see the light that came from my object. But if I extend each one of these rays backwards, red's going to look like it came from there. Orange is going to look like it came from there. White and green. I would get a point by point recreation of that object. And notice that it is upright, it's bigger, and it is actually a virtual image because those rays of light aren't actually there. All right, we don't have to draw all those lines to figure out where the image is. We only have to draw a couple of lines to figure out where the image is. So one, and we're going to use ray diagrams to figure out the characteristic of the image and, and where it is at. So here we go. If we draw a ray parallel to this axis, it's going to go through the focal point. Or if we drew a ray through the focal point, it will come back parallel. If I drew a ray of light through the center of its curvature, 
it's going to hit squarely on and just bounce straight back through the center. We only need two of those lines to intersect to figure out where the image is, but we have three lines that we could draw. So let's see what I mean. I'm going to place my object between the focal point and the mirror and lights hitting that flower reflecting diffusely. Maybe one of those rays of light from that red in the top of the flower there comes in parallel. It's going to reflect through the focal point. Now light could also go through the focal point this way, or it could just come back off in this direction in line with the focal point. But if it comes in line with the focal point, it will go out parallel. And if I have a ray of light coming from in line with the center of the lens, it's going to just go straight back out through the center of the lens. All right, so where is the image going to be located? If I put my eye here and see where those rays of light either virtually come together or really come together is where I'm going to see that spot in the flower. So I have to extend them backwards and that's all I needed to draw. I didn't need to draw all three of those. All we need to do is see where two of those lines converge to know that the image is going to be virtual. They only virtually came together. It's upright because the rays started above this axis and they ended above that axis. And it was enlarged because this distance here was smaller than this distance there. If I place the object between the focal point and the center and draw the ray diagram for that, so light coming from there comes in parallel, goes through the focal point. Light coming from there going through the focal point and coming out parallel. That's all we needed to draw. Right there I can see that that's where the image is going to be. I could draw the ray of light coming in line with the center, but that doesn't hit my mirror, so I'm not even going to bother with it. This is where the image is located. It's real because the rays of light bouncing off the mirror really come together. It's inverted because it started above and ended below. And it's enlarged because this is a greater distance than this is here. If I place my object past the center or one, two focal lengths or greater more than that, uh, beyond that, I draw the ray diagram, comes in parallel, goes through the focal point, comes through the focal point, comes out parallel. That's where my image is right there. I could draw the ray of light through the center, but it would miss my mirror down here, so I won't even bother drawing that. But that's where the image is going to be located. Red light that reflected diffusely off of that spot is going to look as if it originated from that spot. The rays of light really are there, so it's a real image. It started above and ended below, so it's inverted. This distance here was less than this distance here, so it was reduced. I would pay real careful attention to this right here because you're going to be asked to draw ray diagrams. And often we don't do it with little bouquets. Often we just do it with little arrows here, but it's the same thing. Just draw light from the very top of the arrow and see where it's recreated. So here I have my teddy bear again, and here I've placed the teddy bear inside the focal length, and I see that it is a virtual image, upright and enlarged, just like we found out on the previous slide. Here I have the teddy bear further away. It's beyond the focal point. It's real, inverted, and enlarged. And if I place the teddy bear even farther away, beyond two focal lengths, it's going to be real, inverted, and reduced. The ray diagrams tell you that. These two images, I could place a piece of paper somewhere in here and get that light concentrated back onto that piece of paper as a real image. Can't do that with virtual images. Here's a neat thing. If I have a mirror like this, and this is the focal point for the lower mirror, and a mirror like this with a hole in the top, and this is the focal point for that upper mirror, if I place coins in the bottom there and let light come in through here and reflect diffusely off those coins, we have light coming from the focal point hitting that upper mirror. It's going to reflect parallel, and I have parallel light coming into my lower mirror. 
it's going to reflect and go off through the focal point and out that hole. So if I put my eye here and look into the hole, the light that really came from there is going to look as if I came from there. And it's going to look like those coins are just sitting right at the top. Are those coins, is the image real or virtual? They are a real image because those rays of light really do converge right there. But we can see if we look at a lower angle, if we looked at a lower angle here, the light wouldn't be coming from those coins and we wouldn't see them at all. If I shown a laser here, it looks like those laser, that laser is just hitting those coins. But really what's happening is it's going through the focal point, hitting this mirror, coming off parallel, and coming back and shining on the real coins there. This is the object, this is the image. Magnification is another thing we need to talk about. We can develop an equation to relate magnification. So this is my object and this is my image, and we can see that this was magnified. And I can take the height of my object and the height of my image and just find the ratio of those two to find the magnification. If this was twice as big as this, the magnification was two. If this is half as big as this, the magnification was one half. So if the magnification is greater than one, or sorry, less than one, it's reduced. If the magnification is greater than one, it's enlarged. I'm going to use S for distance. This is the distance of the image. This is the distance of my object. How far my object is from the mirror and how far my image is from the mirror. Two triangles are created and those two triangles are going to be similar. These are alternate interior. These are alternate interior. And if I scoot these over here, when you have similar triangle, corresponding sides are in proportion. So just like I have the height of the image divided by the height of the object, this divided by this would be the same thing as this divided by that. So we can also calculate the magnification by the ratio of the image distance to the object distance. And you might see this with absolute values around it. You might also see it with no absolute values and a negative sign right there. I actually like this equation a little better because it gives you a little more information. Because if the magnification is positive, you, it, that will tell you that the image is upright. If it's negative, it would tell you the image is inverted. Or if you get a positive height, it's upright. A negative height is inverted. If the distance is a positive value, it's a real image. If the distance is a negative value, it's a virtual image. And if this is concave, it would have a positive focal length. And if it's convex, it would have a negative focal length. Let me show you more what I mean by that. If this is the object distance and this is the image distance, the distance from the mirror to the focal point is the focal length. Let's see if we can find a relationship between those three things. I have this triangle here and this triangle here. So this whole distance is S sub I, and if I subtract F from it, that would be the length of that purple triangle. And the same length of that green triangle is going to be just the focal length. So if I take this side divided by this side, it would be the same ratio as this side divided by that side. Corresponding sides are in proportion. So I'm going to cross multiply, and then I'm going to distribute that. This is a negative term, so I'll make it positive by moving to this side. If I divide each term by the same thing, then S sub O is going to cancel and F is going to cancel. S sub I is going to cancel and F is canceling. S sub I, or sorry, S sub O and S sub I are going to cancel. And I'm just left with 1 over S sub I plus 1 over S sub O equals 1 over the focal length. That is another an important equation we need to understand. So we'll check that off our equation sheet and let's get a little practice by doing that. And just a reminder that if the image distance is positive, it's real. If the image distance is negative, it's virtual. This had a positive focal length because it was concave. If it was convex, it would have a negative focal length. 
So let's put some numbers here and I'll show you what I mean by that. Positive focal length and positive object distance. So it's positive focal length because it was concave. We plug the numbers in for object distance and focal length. I'm going to take this term and move it to this side. It becomes negative. And I don't have to find a common denominator. I can just do that as a decimal. Take one over that, minus one over that, and this is the decimal that I get. Be careful. That decimal equals one over the image distance. So to find the image distance, we have to take one over that decimal. When I do that, I find that I get a positive 113 centimeters. A positive means that it's going to be a real image, and that's what we got from the ray diagram. I could come over here and say, hey, if this object here was 7.5 centimeters, I could calculate the magnification, or I could calculate the, the height of the image by that same ratio. And um, when I do that, I get a negative height. A negative height says that it's inverted, and that's what we got from the ray diagram. I could calculate the magnification by taking the ratio of the image distance, image height over object height, and if I keep this negative here and the height that it was right here, I get a negative magnification, which means also means that it's inverted. Okay, so it was bigger because it was greater than one. Let's look briefly at convex mirrors. So this has a negative focal length, okay? And if a ray of light comes in, this is going from the center here is what's perpendicular. So this is equal to this, angle of incidence, angle of reflection, but that ray will be in line with my focal point. Do the same thing here. This is the normal, so that's angle of incidence and angle of reflection. Do the same thing for all of these, and we can see that all these rays of light that reflect off of this convex mirror are going to diverge. They're going to spread out as they go, but all of these lines spreading out look as if they come from right there. Okay, so let's draw a ray diagram. We're going to place an object in front of a divergent mirror, a convex mirror. The ray diagram says one comes in parallel. It's going to reflect off in this direction in line with the focal point. From that same spot, if it comes toward the focal point, it's going to come back off parallel. And these rays coming off look like they come from right there. I could draw one more line going straight toward the center of the lens, and I could also confirm that that is where the image is going to be right there, because the reflected rays look as if they originated from there. Okay, So concave, convex, this was a virtual image, and this was also a virtual image. The ray diagram would tell you that. Okay. One last thing I want to show you is this is a really neat picture that was painted by Istvan Oros, and um, it depicts the book by Jules Verne called Mysterious Island. You see passengers stranded here, a shipwreck, and these mountains, and the bay, and everything. But the cool thing about this is if you put a cylinder here, right where the sun is, you see a reflection of Jules Verne in that picture there. Anyway, that's a little bit about reflection and images that are formed.